This is part two of the polycultures and guilds discussion. Getting ready for a plant sale coming up in a half hour here. So I'm in my, I call this the supermarket. It's a grove of larch that have a bunch of potted plants in them. But that's not really what I want to talk about. I just figured I'd walk past it to get a sense. That's how I hold my plants through the summer. We'll go into that in more detail in another video. But I thought I would talk about a guild um, pretty darn complex and really interesting, I think. It's evolved over time, as is the way with all this stuff. I, I would say distinctly that none of the things I ever talk about are going to be, um, you know, heavily planned on paper, executed in one fell swoop. They're an additive process, subtractive process, uh, and they evolve over years. Um, and so what you're seeing here, this is a five, six year old installation, just a wall of green. <laughs> so who cares? What is that? What is the point of this? Let me see if I can get a better shot. Um, I don't know that I'm going to get a really clear shot of this because it's just so dense. But let me zoom out for a second and give you the overview, and then we'll talk about some of the members of this. Um, this intense greenness here is elderberry. We're right near the road, and so I've planted a bunch of elderberry along the road, and then some near this area. You can see there's tons and tons of elder here. And they've become thick enough now that they actually deflect uh, or at least direct some of the deer activity coming from the road into the property. If I could do it again, I would have planted many more of these, the entire road frontage all the way to the north, another 100, 200 yards, and I probably wouldn't have deer traffic coming through. Um, but they're, they're a neat element in here. But the thing that I thought was a really exciting one was, gosh, I don't know if this is going to be a great video. What we're looking at here is a pollarded buckthorn, European buckthorn. So this was here. That's this guy. And so that wants to be a small tree, big shrub. And so what I've done is I just pollarded it, which is like coppicing but higher. In other words, cutting it when it's dormant. You can see one back in here. There's the main stem, and then it's been cut and allowed to bush out up high. And to that European buckthorn, I've associated a Concord grape. That's this nice beauty here. And so what the grape does is it climbs the buckthorn, gets all through the branches, the leaves, etc., and produces fruit at a really nice picking height. It's about six to eight feet. As the buckthorn gets too big, you can see up there it's getting a little bigger, I can chop and drop those branches and feed them to the Concord grape down below. And since the buckthorn was here, I, f I started that pattern. The next year I came in and I planted a ton of honey locust. Well, not a ton, <laughs> six. Um, and the idea with them is I let them grow for a while, then pollard them and plant more cultivar grapes and let it be this 10 foot high canopy uh, that continually gets chopped and dropped. The honey locust will be better than the buckthorn because it has, at least as far as I know, um, nitrogen fixation although buckthorn seems to fuel the soil pretty nicely as well and the honey locust gives edible pods uh, it's a really nice chop and drop plant and since it has spikes all over it, it helps make a spiky trellis to protect although it'll make it a nuisance to manage if I do this again I probably will do this with thornless honey locust which I've got a whole carpet of seedlings of and so the ideas will be this uh, suppressed succession, this, these, this tree layer that wants to escape but continually being chopped and dropped and used as a trellis to grow vining crops. Just on the outside of that, half as rhizome barrier, half as deer deflector, are gooseberries. And since they tip layer readily, as they grow I can bring their tips down in line with this pathway, can mow pretty closely with my uh, electric push mower and put all the clippings in gooseberries are heavy feeders and as they weave together and lock in and make these spiky arches they'll provide a little bit more deer deflection as well and give me an easy to access crop that's in here so we've got the small bush very small shrub layer we've got the suppressed tree layer so it'll be a large shrub small tree the vining layer climbing up through that so what we'd also like to see with that, if we're going to go for a food forest and the seven layers and all that good stuff, is to see some herbaceous layer. And so what we've done is in this little area where it's a little more open, 
perhaps you can see it, there's a whole beautiful carpet of bee balm. And the bee balm is helping to defend these young service berry, which definitely get deer browsed if they have no protection. There's a black haw in here, since viburnum seems to do really well at this site, I've put in black haw and nanny berry in a number of spots. And the bee balm just kind of fills in and creates a ground cover, beautiful nectar source, etc. You can see a sun choke. I just sneak in random <laughs> stuff as I can. Um, and so that's a really nice herbaceous layer, and you can see actually the Concord grape is running over to here. It'll run through these, protected by deer, and then find a tree and climb. So pretty feral, but uh, you will definitely not see any bare soil in here. And for the last number of years, you can also see there's valerian that I planted in here a ways back. And the valerian actually gets along with the elder very nicely. The elder is bigger than it. And so the valerian, I just basically, as it gets in my way, which isn't really happening much anymore because everything else is big enough, but instead of cutting it, I just take it, the stem is hollow, it cracks very easily, and now I've got this dynamic accumulator, not even chop and drop, stop, stomp and strop <laughs> thing that um, you can see the amount of organic matter in here just from stepping on these for the last few years. It's nice. We're dry right now for sure, but um, Valerian has a really nice fibrous root system, draws up a lot of nutrient, and then I can just step it down. And then <laughs> and then, and then, and then, right? Um, adding in some plums. So here's a nice grafted plum that as it grows, it will want to reach out to the south, which is that way. And so slowly but surely, I'll chop and drop this really nice... I, I, I would say this is a staghorn sumac, but it isn't. It's something very similar. It's very ar aromatic, beautiful flowers. Maybe someone knows what this is. Big plume of flowers that'll come in a, another couple of weeks. So as the plum needs more light, since it's so dry, it's really lucky that that overstory is here because it shelters this plum as it gets established and I can slowly chop and drop and feed that and the plum will become the dominant element and eventually probably have some grapes climbing up it as well. So pretty, pretty rich little polyculture and it's just a, a band that basically is from, you know, one mow path over about 20 feet down into the ditch and then the other side there's other things happening when that goes up to the road. So I'm not trying to grow food crops over there. But uh, yeah, we've got a polyculture here with a, a creeping running ground cover, a seed distributed ground cover in the valerian. Lots of uh, options for chop and drop. I think elder in the future will be an excellent chop and drop candidate just to thin it out for better fruit yield, but then also to have these nice deep green leaves. And I suspect it's, it must be an accumulator. It just always seems happy no matter what's going on. So it's a good sign if a plant maintains vigor through rough times, it's got the ability to feed others. Um, and then you can see the grapes are entering into our canopy, climbing over our young nitrogen fixer food crops that can all be chopped and dropped. All layers go back and ultimately this is a guild about soil building. And since this is the low end of the property, this is where excess water through the winter, after heavy rains, etc., are sent to this general area. So everybody can sop it up, capture a yield, uh, and keep that fertility on site. There's no erosion that's going to happen through a system like this. And you can see the biggest element in here is that European buckthorn which as long as I prune it every two years it doesn't get too weedy and I've got a huge amount of green manure and I leave it until I need the light access, and then I chop and drop it during the summer, ideally after heavy rains, to mulch the fertility back into the soil. And so that'll release more light for other members. So it's really not about, you know, clear cut and install super costly, big risk, everything at once. It's put in the elders, see how they do okay, they're doing great, let's grow some grapes, then let's grow some gooseberries, etc. And so if you're seeing this and thinking, oh, this is so complex, there's so many elements, moving parts, how do you figure that out? You figure it out by starting. <laughs> so put in a tree and say, I want more than just a tree, and put stuff and see what they do. Experiment. If you have pruners and a shovel, you can make changes, right? So 
experiment, explore, get some guilds going, I think you'll have a lot of fun. These are systems that just tend to do really well on their own and over yield if you consider green manure a yield, which I certainly would. A lot of biomass here, a lot of resiliency. So this is our little feral, moist, nutrient-catching hedgerow guild. Thanks for watching. We'll do another one soon.